tonight, a horrifying terror attack in Pakistan. A suicide bomber strikes a volleyball tournament, killing more than 70 people. I'm Jeff Lore. Also tonight, the search for answers in the Christmas jetliner attack. As President Obama reviews the security failures, new questions emerge about his choice to run the agency overseeing airline security. No smoking, no texting, no trans fats. Some new laws for a new year. Plus, backbreaking work for a neighbor they'd never met. You should do for your neighbor as you would like them to do for you. In tonight's American Spirit. This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. Good evening. Katie's off tonight. Pakistan has long been known as one of the world's most dangerous places. What happened today brought the situation to a new and frightening level. A suicide bomber blew up his vehicle in a field during a volleyball tournament in northwest Pakistan. At least 75 people were killed, more than 60 others hurt. No one has claimed responsibility, but Elizabeth Palmer reports tonight authorities say it has all the earmarks of a Taliban attack. A steady stream of wounded people overwhelmed the local hospital. Volleyball players, spectators, and local residents. But police say they weren't the intended targets. The bomber wanted to attack tribal elders opposed to the Taliban, but couldn't reach the mosque where they'd gathered. Instead, he drove his SUV packed with more than 500 pounds of explosives into a field crowded with people watching a volleyball tournament. The massive explosion in the town of Laki Marwat leveled as many as 20 buildings. This is just the latest in a series of deadly bombings in Pakistan. Just four days ago, a suicide bomber captured here on CCTV blew up his car in the port city of Karachi, killing more than 40 people. Altogether, more than 500 people have been killed in bomb attacks since October, when the army launched a major anti-Taliban offensive. The Taliban have fought back with terrorist attacks right across this nuclear-armed country. All of this raises very worrying, serious questions over whether the government has a firm grip on the situation and whether it can actually protect its nuclear installations against possible Taliban attack. It's the ultimate threat from an insurgency that at the start of this new year appears to be growing in both ambition and strength. Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News, London. Now, two days after suffering one of the worst attacks in its history, the CIA vowed to continue hunting down the Taliban. And now new details emerged about Wednesday's suicide bombing at a base in southeast Afghanistan and about who was behind it. Here's Kimberly Dozier. Security may be tighter at the base today, but U.S. officials still don't know exactly how a suicide bomber managed to get in without being searched, killing seven CIA agents, including the base commander. One former intelligence official tells CBS News initial reports indicate the bomber was being recruited by the CIA as a source. And a Pakistani Taliban commander today praised what he called their double agent. He said the bomber was avenging the killing of Taliban leader Baitullah Massoud in a U.S. drone strike last August. Taliban sources tell CBS News the notorious Haqqani network was behind the attack, using Afghan operatives with help from colleagues in Pakistan. The Haqqani group covers both sides of the Afghan-Pakistan border. U.S. officials say the group is responsible for everything from suicide and roadside bombings to the capture of U.S. Private Bo Bergdahl. U.S. commanders say they've been stepping up attacks against the Haqqanis, sending an extra thousand special ops forces across Afghanistan over the past year. Another 500 are due this spring. Senior U.S. officials say the Pakistani government has also agreed to allow small numbers of special ops forces to operate on the ground in the Haqqani's Pakistan stronghold. Forward operating base Chapman was key to gathering intelligence against the Haqqanis and coordinating drone strikes. That mission has been made much more difficult. The bottom line is this was a really important target. They knew what they were doing when they went after this particular base. The suicide attack may have disrupted counter-terrorist operations, but it hasn't stopped them. A Taliban commander tells CBS News a U.S. drone strike in Pakistani territory today took out another top Taliban commander from the Haqqani network. Kimberly Dozier, CBS News, Washington.
And more now on the attempt to blow up Flight 253 on Christmas Day. The Senate Intelligence Committee has scheduled a hearing for January 21st. They're trying to figure out how the suspect was able to board a U.S. bound flight. And as Bob Orr tells us tonight, the White House is conducting its own investigation. The president is spending the last days of his Hawaiian vacation studying reports from his intelligence agencies, detailing the information and security gaps that led to the attempted bombing of Northwest Flight 253. While no one has yet been fired, a senior administration official signaled changes, saying the failure to share information is not going to be tolerated. The CIA, NSA, National Counterterrorism Center, and the State Department all had bits of information about Umar Farouk abdul some of it dating back to communications intercepted by the NSA in August. But abdul was never put on a watch list or identified as a threat until the PETN explosive hidden in his underwear failed to detonate. Security experts say had the suspect been flagged for extra screening, the bomb would have been found. If that person had been a selectee, then a whole protocol that includes explosive detection that does detect PETN would have been applied. Sources tell CBS News it appears the suspect, Abdul Matalab, did not specifically target Christmas Day. Investigators say he did plan to travel during the busy holidays when big crowds and long screening lines would make it less likely that he'd face extra scrutiny. But he only picked the Christmas flight because that was the day a seat was available. And that's consistent with the way Al-Qaeda operates. The terror group does not usually target anniversaries, holidays, or symbolic dates. Instead, al-Qaeda attacks when it's ready and sees an opportunity. Now, investigators tell us they still do not have any evidence of a wider plot. One official put it this way. We don't know of any other bombers in the pipeline. But it's also now clear that Abdul Muttalib had strong ties to al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, a terror group in Yemen that continues to recruit and train would-be jihadists. Jeff? Bob Orr in Washington tonight. Bob, thank you. The Transportation Security Administration currently has no chief. Errol Southers' nomination to head the agency has been held up for months in the Senate. Today we learn Southers could face a new problem. Cheryl Ackerson reports. With heightened concerns over balancing airport security and the right to privacy, it could mean trouble for the president's pick to head up transportation security, Errol Southers. Southers had already admitted to a grave error in judgment made 22 years ago, improperly using his position at the FBI to get a police official to run a background check on the boyfriend of his then estranged wife. So help you God. I do. In November, Southers assured senators under oath it was Have an isolated you. lapse. Have you ever in the past misused your access to databases that the government maintains other than this one incident that led to the censure? No, Senator, I have not. But a week later, Southers contradicted that account. It was in a letter he wrote to the Senate Homeland Security Committee November 20th, as reported in today's Washington Post. Southers admitted it wasn't someone else who accessed confidential government databases, but he himself, and not once, but twice. Southers also disclosed a third apparent breach, that he downloaded confidential law enforcement records in 1987 or 88. We don't have a 22-year-old problem. We have a current problem with this gentleman where he can't really be upfront and tell the truth. We can't have that at the top of our Transportation Security Administration. Peter Galtz, a top transportation official under President Clinton, says the public should not be concerned. I think uh, Salish, from having gone through this examination of his mistake, is going to be very tough on this ex on access to private records. Southers isn't talking, but today the White House said it's standing behind him. With Congress out on holiday break, it's hard to know whether these new revelations will affect his chances at confirmation. Jeff? Cheryl Ackerson at Reagan National tonight. Cheryl, thank you. In Hawaii, Rush Limbaugh was released from a hospital this evening after saying he's been given a clean bill of health. The vacationing 58-year-old radio talk show host was admitted two days ago complaining of chest pains. Limbaugh said to show he's okay, but he said it's been a humbling experience. On Wednesday afternoon, I experienced pain in my upper left chest like I had never experienced before. I had an angiogram, which is a, a catheter treatment through the, uh, through the heart, and they found absolutely nothing wrong. It was a blessing. Limbaugh said he's received, quote, the best treatment in the world and that there's, quote, not one thing wrong with the U.S. health care system. 
Still ahead on the CBS Evening News. More states have banned texting while driving, among the many new laws that begin today. And up next, American hotels overseas have been a prime target for terrorism. But are the hotels here safe? Today's horrific suicide bombing at a volleyball game in Pakistan is a prime example of the places that terrorists prefer to strike. Undefended, soft targets. Locations filled with civilians, like hotels. American-owned hotels overseas in particular. CBS News travel editor Peter Greenberg tonight has more on that, plus a look at why hotels in this country may be vulnerable as well. September 2008, the Marriott in Islamabad. Two months later, the deadly siege at the Taj and Oberoi hotels in Mumbai. July 2009, the twin attacks in Indonesia on a JW Marriott and Ritz-Carlton. The list of attacks on overseas hotels sadly just begins there. American-branded hotels are now the target of choice for terrorists. In the eight years immediately before September 11th, there were 30 hotel bombings. In the eight years since, hotel bombings have more than doubled. So why are hotels considered such easy targets? Multiple entrances and exits, easy vehicle access, and dozens of unattended, uninspected bags. That's a challenge. Anthony Spagnolo has one of the toughest jobs in the business, balancing hospitality with security at New York's largest hotel, the Hilton, with 2,058 rooms and banquet facilities that routinely host more than 3,000 people a night. In an ideal secure world, what would you love to do? Well, being a, a security professional, I love to lock every door, I love to check every bag, look under every car, look into every trunk. It's just not feasible in an open industry as the hotel business is. Hotels and hot zones now employ elaborate and often visible security measures. But in America, even at New York's busiest hotels, cars and trucks pretty much come and go as they please. Lobbies are crowded with guests and non-guests alike. And unattended bags sit, well, unattended. New technologies do exist. Anti-vehicle barriers that can deploy in half a second. Protective window film that prevents flying glass shards that routinely kill and maim victims at a blast site. High detail cameras that can zoom in to help track and identify suspects. And now this, a Boston-based company that has developed plastic mesh wallpaper. It absorbs concussions and can actually maintain a building's structural integrity. The wall does not come tumbling down, which would otherwise happen. The material is currently deployed at military installations and embassies around the world. It will be available for commercial applications in less than a year. Whether or not they choose to follow up on it, of course, comes down to dollars and cents. But remarkably, not a single U.S. hotel firm has even called to inquire about it. Without a single attack on a U.S. hotel, many hospitality companies see it as too costly an investment. I'd venture to say that almost 100 percent of them are not doing much, if anything, for counterterrorism. Raising the question, what price will be paid if nothing is done? Peter Greenberg, CBS News, New York. Iraq's government reacted angrily today to a U.S. court decision dropping all charges against five Americans involved in a deadly shooting in 2007. The judge said prosecutors failed to prove their case. The five Blackwater security guards opened fire in a Baghdad intersection, killing 17 unarmed civilians. Iraq says it may sue Blackwater, now called Z Services, on behalf of the victims and their families. December was the first month since the U.S. invasion in 2003 in which no American troops died in combat in Iraq. 36 were killed last month in Afghanistan. Coming up next year tonight, from cooking with trans fats to snipping cows' tails, some interesting new laws went on the books this New Year's Day. New Year's Day brought us hundreds of new laws that will impact the daily lives of millions of Americans. Some address serious health and social issues. Others make you wonder. Manuel Gallegas takes a look. Before you light up, fry it up, text or tan, check the map. Three more states are taking a stand against smoking in bars and restaurants. Michigan, Wisconsin, and in a landmark victory for anti-smoking advocates, North Carolina, the nation's largest tobacco producer. From a business standpoint, 
I'm looking forward to it. I think uh, the individual uh, restaurant owners ought to be able to make their own decision. Oregon, Illinois, and New Hampshire joined 16 other states in recognizing the danger of texting while driving. Hopefully, by the end of the year, we'll have a ban nationwide. Amen. New Hampshire also becomes the fifth state allowing same sex marriage. Across the country, lawmakers took up issues from the progressive to what some would consider absurd. Out west, it's now illegal for ranchers to cut off a cow's tail to avoid having to clean the animal. In Massachusetts, after 75 years, no more dog races. And in Texas, teenagers can no longer use a tanning salon without an adult. Once again, California leads the way with the most new laws. From installing breathalyzers in the cars of some first-time drunk drivers... We believe that it will help us to bring down the number of incidents involving drunk drivers on our state highways. To making it easier for celebrities to sue aggressive paparazzi, a law credited to actress Jennifer Aniston. The Golden State also becomes the first in the nation to ban the use of trans fat in restaurants. It's all too much government for some. Making sure that people, you know, eat healthy is something that should be up to them and that the government has better things to do. For now, there won't be any policing of trans fat at donut shops or bakeries. They'll be exempt for 2010, giving them time to work on a new recipe for a new decade. Manuel Gallegos, CBS News, New York. A college football legend bowed out today. Florida State's Bobby Bowden coached his final game, ending a career that spanned 44 years as a head coach. He went out a winner in the Gator Bowl. His Seminoles beat West Virginia 33-21. Bowden, who is 80, retires with two national championships and 389 victories, second all-time to Joe Paterno at Penn State. In Pasadena, California, New Year's tradition, the Rose Parade. Sully Sullenberger, the hero in the Hudson, is Grand Marshal. Among the performers today, students from the Ohio State School for the Blind, the first marching band of its kind. You might remember them from Steve Hartman's Assignment America. They practiced for a year and a half to get ready for this big day. Next, up from the ashes, a barn and a life revived by the American spirit. So we begin a new year. It is worth remembering another America that scarcely exists anymore. It is a mythic rural place lacking in high technology. But as Jim Axelrod reports, it is rich in the American spirit. There's a timeless quality in the Cumberland Mountains of Western Maryland, where steam engines puff through the valley on picturesque stretches of track, unloading trains full of railroad buffs who pay good money to get great shots. No place was better than Helmstetter's Curve where John Helmstetter's barn made for the perfect picture. So imagine the shock when one day the barn was simply gone, burned to the ground in a fire. Come on. John Helmstetter lost a third of his cattle. His border collie, Teddy, perished as well. My whole life was going up, you know, it was going. The cost to rebuild was nearly $100,000, money John just didn't have. There was days when I just wanted to give up. Forget it. The railroad buffs like Carl Franz were devastated too. We said we have to do something to bring back what we once had and try to recreate what was lost. So Carl raised some money to raise a new barn. His goal was $10,000, but by the time he was done, he'd collected over $41,000, covering what John's insurance did not. Thank you all very much. John Helmstetter couldn't have imagined rebuilding his barn without Carl's help. That's what friends do for friends. But how do you explain what these men are doing to help John put his life back together? <laughs> Neighbors who John had never met, hundreds of local Amish men showed up, providing three full days of strong backs and experienced hands, and leaving John Helmstetter with the will to go forward. There's no way I could get anything accomplished without all the help and, and everybody pitching in. So the train buffs get back their view. The Amish get paid a small fee from John, which they'll put toward their community health center. And John gets back his barn. His sister Ann says he's starting to put his life back together. He's now going to have his job back. 
which was his life. A community has been reminded of an old lesson that can't be taught enough. You should do for your neighbor as you would like them to do for you. If everybody were more helping, it would be a better place to live. A thought older than that steam engine running through John Helmstetter's farm, and more powerful as well. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, Cumberland, Maryland. Great story. That is the CBS Evening News tonight. For Katie Couric, I'm Jeff Glore. I'll see you back here tomorrow night as well. For now, Happy New Year. Good night.